I now invite Shamla Chandrasekharan, Advocacy Manager at Arrow. Shamla has a decade of hands-on experience in management of programs with particular focus on HIV, harm reduction, key populations, and so on and on. She has co-authored several publications with the HIV sector within the Ministry of Health, Malaysia. Shamla will tell us about the adoption of Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals, and she will also speak on the Universal Periodic Review. Over to you, Shamla. Thank you, Shobha. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shamla, and I'm from the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow. I will be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030, and also the Universal Pre Periodic Review or the UPR. Next. So let's start with the Agenda 2030. Um, the Agenda 2030 is basically a universal agenda, and it is also referred to as the most comprehensive um, blueprint for global action for achieving sustainable development. The Agenda 2030 consists of um, 17 SDGs and 169 targets, and it has the aim to eliminate uh, extreme poverty, reducing inequality, and to protect the planet with a focus on the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. So the Agenda 2030 was adopted in um, 2015 by all countries of the United Nations, and it builds on the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. And um, it applies to all countries and actors, including the governments, the UN, and also other actors. Now, in the context of the SDGs, um, many of you uh, must have heard about the Leaving No One Behind commitment. Um, this leaving no one behind is actually a pledge, right? Uh, a pledge to emphasize that the um, Agenda 2030 need to do more than the average improvements in targets, including achieving um, several life-changing zeros. Again, many of you may have heard this already. This includes um, achieving zero poverty, zero hunger, getting to zero AIDS. So this pledge basically pushes for investment and efforts um, targeted at reaching those furthest behind first, as in the most marginalized first, so that no one is left behind. And um, such a commitment, uh, you'd agree, is important to accelerate progress towards achieving the Agenda 2030. Also, um, the Agenda 2030 is anchored by a multi-stakeholder approach, which is the core of the um, 2030 Agenda. And it requires commitment and dedication from all actors and societies, uh, in addition to the governments and the UN, in order to realize um, the goals of the Agenda 2030 and its targets. The interventions and actions also requires expertise, technology, and financial resources from businesses, academia, um, civil society, and individuals. You see, um, the 17 SDGs, they are connected, they, they are interlinked, meaning progress or lack of progress in one area will have an impact on the outcomes of other areas. So, um, for example, actions on um, to support women and girls' empowerment and gender equality oftentimes uh, accelerate or has the power to also boost local economies and also increase women's full and effective participation, as well as equal opportunities, um, you know, like for leaderships at different levels of decision-making, including in political, economic, and also public sphere. Next. Here you see the 17 goals, to name a few, um, goal five on strengthening gender equality, goal 13 on taking climate action, Goal one on uh, eradicating poverty and 16 on promoting peaceful societies. So these are among the goals to shift into a more sustainable development uh, at the global level. Next. Now, how is um, or how are the SDGs linked with gender equality? Definitely when some communities or groups, including women and girls, are denied their full human rights and opportunities, 
achieving sustainable development becomes um, a target that is not possible. And as such, the Agenda 2030, um, it recognizes and emphasizes that gender equality and also the empowerment of women and girls is actually a fundamental human right and is crucial for ensuring progress across the goals and targets for sustainable development. So gender equality is sort of the core for 2030 agenda. And gender equality in addition um, to being a goal uh, on its own, gender equality also cuts across the 17 sustainable development goals and it is reflected, um, this is reflected in, in the 45 targets and the 54 indicators of the SDGs. It basically um, envisions for women and girls to enjoy equal access to quality education, uh, economic resources and political participation, as well as equal opportunities for employment, leadership, and decision-making at uh, different levels. Um, for achieving gender equality, the SDG aim and push for closing gender gap and strengthen support for gender equality and the empowerment of women, including at the global, uh, regional, and also national levels. It also envisions for um, all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls to be eliminated. And finally, it strongly believes in gender perspective, as in it applies gender sensitive approaches in the implementation of the Agenda 2030 in a um, holistic and inclusive manner in line with uh, its principle of leaving no one behind that I just shared. Next slide. Now, in terms of accountability, so you may have this question, right? Who, who is accountable in terms of ensuring um, the implementation of this agenda, who does the monitoring of, um, you know, whether or not there is progress, what are the gaps, and um, how the gaps are being addressed. Well, um, the governments have the primary responsibility for the implementation, for the follow-up, and also the review of the implementation of, uh, at all levels, including, you know, at the national, regional, and global levels, especially in relation to um, reporting on the progress made in implementing the goals and also the targets in the uh, period of 15 years. So the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Annual High Level Political Forum, or also known as the HLPF, actually plays a central role in the review mechanism, you know, in reviewing the government's implementation of the 2030 Agenda and this meeting convenes in July on an uh, annual basis in um, UN New York. So um, the HLPF is a platform where the governments present their voluntary national reports uh, through the voluntary national review or the uh, VNR mechanism. And this mechanism is basically to update on the status uh, of SDG implementation at the national level in their respective countries. So this review um, in line with the SDGs looks into the progress, gaps, challenges in realizing the SDGs in the uh, respective country contexts. The VNR um, is actually an important component of uh, the review mechanism, uh, mainly to hold governments accountable to their commitments and to further mobilize efforts and identify solutions to achieve the SDGs. And um, while there is no frequency for reporting mandated for BNRs, uh, the UN Secretary General has recommended that all countries conduct at least two BNRs during the 15 years. Participants, please mute yourself. Thank you. Yes, Shamala. Thank you. At the regional level, um, there is the annual Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development or the APFSD, which is an important part of the follow up and also the review process of the 2030 agenda, but this is at the regional level. So as an annual intergovernmental forum, the APFSD actually supports the region to prepare for the HLPF at the global level um, by enhancing their capacity and also um, by capturing and sharing regional perspectives 
and supporting the review of progress uh, towards implementation of the 2030 agenda. Next. Yeah, so that's all on the SDGs. Next, uh, we will look at the UPR. Now, what is UPR? Um, the UPR is a periodic review of the human rights records of all the 193 UN member states. The UPR was established um, in 20, uh, 2006, and it is a powerful accountability mechanism for holding states accountable, including for sexual and reproductive health and rights actions. So it brings, um, it serves as a platform to bring international attention and pressure for governments to improve the human rights situation in their respective countries. It is basically a state-led and uh, peer-reviewed process which focuses on the actions countries need to take to uh, fulfill their agreed human rights obligations. So countries report once almost every five years on the actions that they have taken during the review period to improve the human rights situations. And these actions are um, presented as uh, recommendations. They are raised as recommendations in the past review, which the member state would have either accepted. So to say, uh, when you say accepted in UN la official language is to support, or they can uh, also say they take note of. To note means um, basically they are not accepting the recommendations and they will provide explanation, for example, that they are um, thinking of implementing it or they are not going to implement it or maybe even they have already implemented those uh, recommendations. So overall, the review um, follows up on the implementation of past recommendations accepted by the state and it also allows for um, discussions of new emerging human rights situations and issues and also the recommendations. Um, who conducts the review? Um, the review will be conducted by the UPR Working Group, which consists of the 47 members of the Council. There will be three sessions per year, and each session will be for two weeks. And um, a total of 14 countries will be reviewed each session, and this totals to the 42 countries per year and the total of 193 countries by the end of each UPR cycle. Next. Uh, now let's look at the documents considered at each review. So first we have the national report. The national report is basically the information provided by the state under review. Um, this report can be provided orally, and when it's provided orally, it's during the review, or the government can also provide in writing. So for information that is provided in writing, the written report should not be longer than 20 pages, and it must be submitted six weeks before the actual review in all uh, official UN languages. And uh, before they prepare the report, states are encouraged to conduct national level consultations, including um, with NGOs and other relevant stakeholders to prepare their national report. And um, so this national report contains information, including on the consultation process, what are the different briefings and processes that they have taken, uh, they have implemented at the national level, what are the international obligations? Uh, what is the state's human rights achievements and best practices during the review period? It also includes information on the challenges, gaps uh, that the state has faced in implementing the recommendations that they have accepted. And it also includes um, the country's key national priorities and commitments that the um, government intends to undertake to improve its human rights situation. Then we have the UN Summary Report, which is a 10-page compilation of information from treaty bodies, uh, as well as UN Special Procedures and other relevant UN documents um, that is specific to the state under review. This report, like the national report, must also be submitted six weeks um, prior to the review. Next. And finally, we have the Stakeholder Summary Report, which is basically a 10-page summary report prepared by the 
um, Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights or the OHCHR. And it is prepared based on all the submissions received from other actors. And this includes as NGOs, um, <clears throat> excuse me, national human rights institutions, academic and also research institutions. So as I just said, the NGO reports falls under this and um, NGOs can submit report focused on issues and recommendations from the NGO's perspective on how to improve um, human rights conditions in, in their country. So the report can um, also focus on the implementation of recommendations from previous UPR session as a follow-up measure. And um, the NGOs can also choose to highlight new human rights violation issues in the country. And in terms of guidelines, um, NGOs can submit either individual or joint submission uh, so for joint submission, it's done uh, with larger coalition of NGOs. Of course, the word limit is different for these two types of submissions. Uh, the limit is lesser for individual submission, which is at um, 2,815. And for joint submission, you have a bit more words. It is at 5,630. The reports are submitted um, using an online system, and you will actually see this link in the man manual that will be shared with you. Uh, next. And so now we will look at what happens during the review. Uh, during the review meeting, which takes place in the form uh, of an interactive discussion, the country under review will receive recommendations from the UN member states and the recommendations will be focused again on improving the human rights situation in the country. Overall, um, the meeting will be a three and a half hour interactive dialogue, and this will be held in uh, UN Geneva with the member state um, that is under review, as well as the working group. Um, also, the dialogue will be chaired by the council president. And here, the NGOs can only observe, but Prior to the session, the NGOs can um, organize informal briefings and lobby friendly member states to raise particular concern or make recommendations on behalf of the NGO as outlined in the NGO stakeholder report during the actual review. So before the review, you can actually share uh, the stakeholder report with the, with, uh, the friendly mem uh, member states. Uh, sharing what your recommendations are for the particular issue that you have focused on, and also ask, um, make a request to the member state to raise the recommendations on behalf of you during the review. So all the recommendations provided during the uh, review meeting will be recorded in an outcome document, which is the working group report that consists of uh, the summary of the interactive dialogue, the discussion, as well as the questions, comments, and recommendations made by the states to the country under review. Um, in addition to this, the responses by the state under review will also be recorded in this document. The um, state under review must respond to the recommendations that, has, that are raised during the a review whether, as I mentioned earlier, whether they support um, or accept uh, for implementation or they take note of the recommendation. So that is why it is very important that NGOs, um, in terms of lobbying, share their report with friendly member states to increase the awareness on the focus issue and also to encourage the member state to make recommendations to the state under review to resolve the issue. The review meeting is then uh, followed by the adoption of report by the Human Rights Council, uh, uh, where the final report will be considered and adopted during a one hour meeting by the Human Rights Council. So the state under review will indicate its position on each of the recommendations um, raised during the working group dialogue. And as I was saying earlier, the state under review, you know, have the option to either accept or um, not to accept the recommendations received. And during this adoptions, adoption, NGOs um, have the opportunity to make oral intervention, commenting on the state's stand on the recommendations. 
So NGOs can um, prepare their intervention based on the working group report and also the addendum report. The addendum is um, where you will find information on which are the recommendations that the state has supported and which are the ones they note. Next. Now, in terms of opportunities for engagement to sum it up, um, the opportunities include uh, the submission of NGO stakeholder report listing uh, concrete recommendations for improving human rights situation in the country. Then NGOs can also participate in the national consultation by the government to provide inputs to the national report. See, the states are always encouraged to hold national consultation with all uh, relevant stakeholders, including the civil society when preparing their report. So here, NGOs can urge the state to organize consultations and um, alternatively, NGOs can also invite government representative to community consultations for active dialogue uh, with the state when preparing the NGO stakeholder report. Um, lobbying friendly member states to support your recommendations and raising it during the review is also a great strategy. You can prepare a one page summary report highlighting issues of focus and your recommendations with the identified friendly member state. And as I was saying earlier, request them to raise the recommendations for you during the review. Um, one example that I would like to share is earlier this year during Nepal's review, youth led organizations lobbied to raise recommendations on comprehensive sexuality education. And it was indeed raised by a few states during the review. Um, and the recommendation were uh, recorded in the working group report. And um, when the meeting concluded, the government actually supported the recommendations raised. So yeah, it was really satisfying to see um, the recommendations being supported by the state under review in the outcome document. Um, then NGOs can also observe the working group interactive dialogue. And finally, NGOs can deliver an oral intervention during the adoption. Um, this is an opportunity to comment on the recommendations supported and noted by the state under review, especially to further stress the importance of supporting some of the recommendations uh, raised during the review, as well as to put pressure on the implementation of the recommendations that were supported. Um, it is also important to highlight that the Human Rights Council has agreed that a gender perspective should be fully integrated throughout the UPR. And this actually allows for uh, gender uh, sensitive and uh, responsive actions and uh, approaches because uh, it, it basically allows for gender perspective to be integrated in all the interventions and submissions, pushing for a more gender sensitive approach. Next, uh, what happens after the review? After the review, the state is responsible for implementing the recommendations accepted, and the state actually has to report back on the implementation in the next review. So they have like almost uh, 4.5 years to implement all the recommendations that they have received. For NGOs, this is an opportunity to follow up with the state uh, on the implementation of actions. NGOs, uh, once the review has been conducted, uh, has concluded and just can publicize the recommendations accepted and promote action on the recommendations once you're back in the country. This uh, actually indirectly puts pressure on the government to act on the recommendations that they have accepted. Next. So yes, we have come to the final slide. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. You can, uh, for any questions, you can actually reach me at shamla at arrow.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamla. It would be great if you could just put in your email in the chat box. Uh, and friends, as Shamla has to rush to a meeting, she will not be able to take up questions orally, but will respond in writing in the chat box if you put any questions there. And thank you once again, Shamla for finding time for this very, very important input.